and well, I was in this town called Old Orchard Beach, Maine. I was walking down the street and I saw there was a dive bar and there was this sort of guy outside of the bar and I was me, it was me and two other uh, um, castmates of that group. Um, and then he said, and I, and I was just, you know, when, you know when, when you're a tourist, you know, you don't know anything, you're just like looking around. And then somebody said something, and, and and because my English wasn't you know that perfect, and he said it so fast, and I and I was and I wasn't sure that that I, what what he said. But then the one guy was next to me was a white guy from Montana, I was my castmate, and he turned red, and I looked at him and I said, Chris, did he say what I think he said? And he said yes, and he said, oh, if he's a jerk, and then I, and and I said to Chris, I said, Chris. He doesn't know that actually I'm not even African American because I wasn't born here. So that word doesn't have the same meaning to me or at least the same impact. But also, I knew that he didn't, he didn't need to know me um, to use that word because it was because of the cost of my skin. But that was the, my, my first sort of intro introduction. So now, 20 years later, back, which is now, and I realize how important it is to have this conversation, and especially in the context of, you know, interracial friendship, interracial relationships. Because right now, what just happened, um, you know, with George Floyd and everything like that, I have a lot of white friends that have even had white lovers. Many of my white friends have remained silent, and that was hurtful to me. And I can imagine why they may remain silent, why they remain silent, because, you know, they may say, I don't know what to say, you know, what to do. But again, to me, I'm like, you know, that, that doesn't help me. So now, and, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm and I'm very understanding toward them, but I'm realizing, oh my gosh, okay. So as of now, I'm making this commitment to have this conversation with all my white friends, whether it's lovers or just friends, because what what I've discovered, what is the truth for me, I am Eve, but in the United States, I am a black man because this is a racist society. The racist society doesn't need to know who I am as a person first. They see a black man and they're gonna treat me like that. So if I have a white lover or I have a white friend, I need to tell them this is how they see me. So we're gonna have to have this conversation maybe on a daily basis because it's not really me, but this is how I'm being treated. You know, so we need to acknowledge that. Again, it's like, you know, when you're gay, and um, you know, I mean, you know, you have that. I mean, you know, like if, let's say if you live in a homophobic society, the first thing that they see, they see you as a gay person and you cannot pretend whether you hide it or whatever. So my thing is I realize this is how important it is for me to have those conversations on an ongoing basis. And that's why, you know, um, I, I decided to, to link this workshop. So that's my introduction, my location. So wherever I wanna, oh, by the way, um, Freddie, I just asked me the best way to, um, 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 talk, not with your hand, but just, just, just chat, saying, you know, you want to go next, and then Freddie will let, will let you speak. Okay, so I'm done. So whoever next, please introduce yourself, say where you're from, and then the reason why you want you wanted to take this workshop. Eves, I think with this portion, um, I think the best way to do it is like I'll just call on people one by one to introduce themselves. And then later they can use the chat when they're yes okay. So I'm gonna go in the order that I see them on the screen. Okay, sounds good. And I'm next to you on the screen, so I'll just say I'm Freddie and I'm at Eastern Mountain, and I'm really glad that we're hosting this. Okay. We're having this conversation. Um, and thank you for being here. And so the next person to introduce themselves, if you'd unmute yourself, is Doug Reed. Uh, so I'm Doug. I'm uh, right now in Virginia. Um, more or less grew up here. Not far from Jefferson's Monticello Declaration of Independence and all that uh, challenge of the day. Um, Steve Schwarzberg called it Interdependence Day and I like that. Uh, I am here because I want to know more. I want to have closer contact with blacks. Um, something that I read recently was how, oh, I'm probably going on too long, <laughs> was how white folks in this country are in a bubble from birth to grave uh, without a whole lot of interaction. And I don't want to continue that way. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. 
Um, can we hear from Stephen? Hi, my name is uh, Steve and I live in Boston. And again, uh, thank you guys for having this, this conversation. Uh, I've started conversations and just want to continue and primarily examine my own racism because I think we all have some, we're all races. And I, I just want to explore that and have conversation and dialogue. And uh, so, and with all the recent events, Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Can we hear from Michael? Michael, I'm from Tennessee. Uh, don't let that scare you. Um, I'm here for the same reason that everybody else is. Uh, same things that Doug said and Steve said. Thanks, Michael. Um, can we hear from Nathan and, and Robert? that okay. um, I'm Nathan and this is my husband Robert we'll kind of do a combined thing here we're from Kalamazoo Michigan and uh, we've been married for going on seven years six years and together ten yeah um, so this conversation thank you is a very live one for us we are constantly talking about this um, and we're just really happy that this is happening in the Easton community as well. Um, it's possible for many people to go through most of their lives without ever having discussions like this. And uh, that's one of the things that needs to change. Um, do you have anything? Um, I agree completely. And I'm just so glad that you're having this session. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Hi, Sunfire. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Sunfire from uh, Eastern Mountain, and uh, I just am here because I think this is important. Uh, it's important uh, for us at Eastern Mountain, uh, where uh, we try to be welcoming to everyone, but sometimes uh, we can say things or do things that we don't mean to be uh, racist, but uh, uh, they come out that way. So uh, I uh, just, uh, we just need to learn more about this, I believe. Thanks, Sunfire. Hi, George, your turn. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I grew up in Boston um, in a primarily black neighborhood called Roxbury during um, desegregation um, and busing. And um, went to a school led by a black woman and it was very racially diverse. And I, as I got older, I realized I had a very unusual education as a white student in Boston. Um, and I, it, it, this is really important and these conversations are really important I feel like a, as a really lifelong learning around unlearning racism as a white person who's benefited um, from white supremacy and is racist and learning. Um, I also am on a board of an LGBT legal organization and facilitate diversity, inclusion, equity discussions and trainings. So I'm always looking for ideas and resources and things and work to do with other people as well. Thank you. Thanks, George. Hi, David. Can you introduce yourself? David Sclaru. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm David Sclaru. I live in Connecticut. And uh, this interests me because I think it's a really important topic. Um, 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 you know, I've had white privilege um, all my life, and it's something I've become more and more aware of, uh, you know, as an adult, certainly. And I think that, um, you know, the systemic racism that was just built into the culture I grew up with in very, very subtle ways is, is, is very nefarious. And I've been working in my life to, to put light on the beliefs whether they're my beliefs or just part, parts of the culture I live in, and to um, bring to light opportunities to, um, to unlearn patterns that are destructive and um, to uh, undo the, the, any you know, racist beliefs that, that I might have that maybe I'm not even aware of. So I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you, David. Hi, Millard. Can you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Millard, and I live in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. 
Yves, bienvenue aux États-Unis. Quel plaisir que vous êtes ici avec nous. I'm here today to listen, to learn, and to grow. Thank you, Miller. Chris Panzica. Hi. Um, thank you, Freddie, and thank you, Eve. Um, I'm in uh, New York City. I'm here um, because I've always thought of myself as not racist, but I kind of learned more about anti-racism more recently, and then just how much work I can actually, or or what I, I wanted to basically get a better sense of what I can do in my life, and and kind of acknowledge how I benefit from white supremacy um, and, and how I can really be anti-racist. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. I, um, let's hear from Jake. Hi, I'm really glad to be here. Um, so my background is I'm second generation Arab American and actually my mother is people who, my mother who is Arabic, are from West Roxbury in Boston. Um, then my mother moved to New York, so I'm a New Yorker basically all my life, but now I'm in Oregon. Anyway, um, uh, I, this is just so important and I really want to, I feel like I have experienced all my life like shades of racism related to being Arabic and growing up in a Jewish community but clearly I'm white, and so I have a very different experience on the street. Um, and I wanna just keep learning how to be an anti-racist and do what I can to have a more peaceful world. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, Jake. David A. You're still muted, David. I am David. I live in Cambridge, Mass. And uh, I'm very interested in this topic. I feel like I want to grow in learning. I want to grow in awareness. And I'm really looking forward to, to this workshop and learning as much as I can. Thanks. Thanks, David. Hi, Leo. Go ahead. Thank you. OK, well, I'm from Montreal originally. Um, where I didn't know from the American black-white issue, um, I, at least where I lived, uh, Haitians, of course. And, uh, but when I came to the US, I'm gonna use some strong words here. I have to say I became a racist, okay? Um, it seeps into you like osmosis in this country, um, okay? It just does. This country is immersed in it. It was built on it. Uh, anyway, I don't want to go on and on. Um, I have lots to say. Um, I'm learning stuff every day now. I've got demonstrations in front of my building here in Greenwich Village. Um, um, I highly recommend a lecture by Jeffrey Robinson of the ACLU on the history of race in America. It's free on YouTube. I mean, to learn, just one, one thing, to learn that each of the seceding states had a declaration clearly stating that they were seceding to preserve slavery in each of the states, the, the original seven. I didn't know that. And so there's nothing, forget the state's rights thing and all that. Anyway, uh, I've got open ears. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Um, William, William Colburn. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm in Detroit, grew up in Detroit, still live here. Um, probably many of you know, it's 80% uh, African American city. So it's been, but being white, it's a lifelong process of unlearning racism. Um, so I was really pleased that this was being offered. Also was anxious to have a conversation amongst other gay men on this topic. And appreciate Eve taking on uh, leading this conversation. Thank you very much, William. Hey, John, can you introduce yourself to everyone? Sure, I'm John Stasio. Um, thank you, Eve, for doing this for us. I, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, 
part of our mission at Easton Mountain and part of my personal mission is to uh, create opportunities for people to learn to love one another and be more supportive and make the world a better place. And, and I think it's, uh, this is such an important part of uh, the work that we have to do as uh, Americans and as men who love men. And, and uh, at this particular time, I mean, it's just, it's one of the major challenges to building harmonious community to face our, uh, our, our conscious and unconscious racism. So I really appreciate that we can have this conversation and I hope we'll be, uh, we'll be patient with one another and we'll challenge one another to wake up. Thanks so much, John. Um, Nirmal. Hi, my name is Nirmal and I live in New York City. And uh, I'm really interested in trying to find ways to engage with people with very different points of view about race from me with, uh, so that we can really hear each other and try and facilitate change. It, it just has been very difficult to uh, to be in conversations and online and otherwise where we're actually hearing each other and and any kind of change happens. So that's about it. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Arnie. Hi, hi everyone, and Eve. Thank you for doing this nice to meet you after having some communication on uh, Facebook. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, my name is Arnie, I live in Boston, and I've been going to Eastern Mountain since 2007 and uh, teaching there. Uh, I wanted to share one experience that was very eye-opening. Uh, I led a workshop there on touch about three or four years ago, and there was one man of color there who was maybe 22, 25, and he said, He'd never been out of the city to the country before, and it really blew me away. Just again, just the taking for granted that I've been able, to, I've traveled and had all these opportunities that he hadn't had to. That moment was a turning point in a way. It opened him up to something, and it was it, it kind of was really a teachable moment. And so um, I'm just here to listen and learn and. Um, I'm grateful for a safe space to have conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Arnie. And let's hear from Gary. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Gary uh, here in New Rochelle, New York, the immediate suburbs of New York City. And uh, I'm here because these conversations are probably the most important conversations we can be having uh, at this time. And uh, I want to be more aware of, of myself and my thoughts and my beliefs, unconscious, conscious. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. Forgive me if I go off video from time to time. I'm, I'm nursing a bad back. So thanks. Thank you, Gary. And thanks to everyone for introducing themselves. Thank you for being here. What about you, Freddie? I did. You did? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I said, I'm, I'm Freddie, and I live here at Easton Mountain, and I'm so glad that we're all here having this conversation, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here to do this work. It's work that we need to do, and I'm ready to dive in. <clears throat> so back to you, Eves. Uh, hello okay i'm good um thank you everyone for introducing yourself and then for sharing your location and the reason why you decided to um take this workshop so i i heard a couple of things that sort of like i'm gonna use those use those as a segue to get to the next uh section so i think it was um arnie who said um, two years ago when he facilitated or three or four years ago when he facilitated that workshop and then he met this young uh black brown brother who had not um uh left the country well not who had not visited the country first so that's one way to get it which is true so that that probably that was a a, a beginning to um you know that that sort of opened a little window to see how separate we are far from each other but there's a, there's another one there's another there's, there's, a, there's a flip side of, of that same story and i think there was one of the reading that i included in the list 
and it was about this this white guy who became who befriended this young African American, and then he said in because actually because the guy died apparently already, but then he was some kind of apology where he said, well. I never wanted to go and visit your family, your neighborhood. So it's not just like, you know, black and brown folks who don't go, let's say, who don't uh, venture into um, the wild or visit, you know, the country, but also white folks don't go into inner cities. So why? You know what I mean? So that's, that's, that's the whole, that's, that's the divide. And, then, and that's going to help me to get to the, the next point. And then I think Leo also acknowledged that he was a racist after he moved from Canada. And that's where we need to start. Um, so again, I'm a foreigner, so I was not born into this. So I came here and then I was, you know, with my open eyes and everything. And I said, I've been learning. And I think after 21 years living in a place, you know, you get to learn a lot of things, right? So one of the things, you know, and, and of course, not just by observing, but by reading, you know, my education. So I do a lot of that, so, um, a lot of things on that. I realized uh, recently I shared with, the, with some friends, there was a paper. I went to Boston College for graduate school in, in, in social work. Um, and, um, I wrote a paper about Emmett Till death 17 years ago. And I was reading, reading it the other day, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that I was talking about this in 17 years ago, which was crazy. So again, because these things, you know, apparently we, we have not moved too far from, you know, the systemic sort of like crisis that's, that, 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 that is at the, at the foundation of this country. So, um, Racism is embedded, and, and I know it's a hard truth to acknowledge, but then that, that's what I wanted to sort of give a shout out to Leo for acknowledging that. So I'm going to start with this statement. Racism is embedded in white culture, but that doesn't make white people bad. Like, you know, so, and that's the whole thing. I think I saw, I saw Freddie made a comment also on Facebook the other day that, you know, I think you said something similar to that. Like, yes, you may have white, you, you probably, I mean, I don't think there's any white family or white person who would not have, a, you know, racist tendencies or, or however way you want to put it. But then that doesn't make you, uh, uh, you know, a bad person. Because the thing is, because it, it's been so systemic and it's, 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 it has permeated the whole society. So it's hard not to have it. Not to, it's, like, it's, like, it's like the air. You know, we all breathe, we, we breathe the air in. It's, it's hard not to, 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 to sip it in, right? But then now, what do you do with that? Because again, and that's, why, and that's why now this, this conversation is so important. For the longest time, people didn't want to have that conversation because they're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, if you say that I'm racist, you know, and I don't identify with the KKKs, people who are killing people or you know, police, then that cannot be me. So by not wanting to have that conversation, to acknowledge your own participation in that system, then that's what has been making it so hard and, and that actually sort of created the divide even, even more. And um, recently, one of my friends, um, uh, one of my friend's boyfriend, um, who, this white guy, again, no, no judgment, I mean, you know, we like what we like, but he's a black guy. I mean, he's, I'm sorry, he's a white, my friend is a black guy from Haiti, but he, one of his former partner, white guy, only dates exclusively black men. Okay, no worries, that's fine, you know, um, that's what he likes. And uh, you would go to his party at his, at his house, and then most of his guests would be black guys or black women or whatever. They would be somewhere. Recently, he posted something on Facebook. To me, it was so shocking, I could not believe it. And it was like some kind of fake CDC, CD, CDC stat saying that, I think back in 2014, there were nine Um, I think we lost Eve's sound for a second there. Um, Eve, can you hear me? You can still be racist while being that. And that's really hard for some people to even understand. But again, being racist doesn't make you a bad person. So my thing is, is about like, you know, acknowledging the level of racism that you have, you have sort of learned from society, from your family, dynamics, whatever. And then now said, okay, how am I going to unlearn that? so that it can help me to foster better friendships, foster better relationships, understand the, the, the systemic crisis and everything like that. So having said that, so the ne this next section, I want to ask all of you, because I know, I hope some of you may have done some of the readings or watched some of the videos, but again, because I, 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 
cautiously selected all those videos and likes because, it, because each of them will come from different um, angles. So did anything resonate with you? And what is that, what is that thing? Whether it's a question, whether it's a comment, whether it's, uh, it's, it's an acknowledgement of something that you've been feeling or you've noticed, um, and then and then the reading of the video sort of like said, oh my gosh, yes, I get this, I get this. So I I want I want to hear from every single each one of you to see what resonated what resonated with you or what struck a chord with you from either the one of the readings or the videos or whatever. So take take it away, Freddie. So if you if you um just just type your name if you want to go first, and then Freddie will. We'll, fa we'll, we'll, we'll facilitate the order. Just type in the chat if you want to speak, and I'll call on you. Uh, while we're waiting for people, Eves, I just want to let you know that there's a little bit of an audio issue. Okay. And I'm having a little trouble hearing you sometimes. I think it's hard to hear you when you talk really fast. Oh, be aware okay. Of that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Well, I think it's just because of the audio issues. If you were in the room, I don't think it would be an issue. Okay. Does anybody want to make any comments on any of the readings or the videos? I, I think Jake. Jake. Did, did Jake say he wanted to go? Yeah, sorry. I just did something weird to the... Okay. Um, well, I didn't notice that you had um, readings, unfortunately, so I didn't have a chance to look at them. I hope I can go back and see what you have because I'm interested. But um, I've been reading um, How to Be... Oh, the book by Kendi, How to, how to Be an Anti-Racist. And... Um, It's, I'm drawing a blank, oh my God, I'm nervous. Um, in the beginning, you know, he starts in the beginning talking about himself as a teenager, that's how it starts out, right? And, um, you know, reflecting on his high school experience and then on his parents, kind of where his parents had come from and, you know, and that just, that, helped me I started to go back and think about myself and what I was exposed to and what my what I was exposed to with my parents and my environment and it was it was interesting because then I realized the eight how young he was when he started he gave some dates and I was like oh my god like I'm way older than this guy you know I'm 60 and um I don't know. I guess, you know, it's like, it was just, you know, as it happened, right? Like, it's just so disturbing that things just are continuing on, obviously. Um, um, it, it, I don't know. That's what came into my mind. Um, and I just wanted to share just, just, just how, you know, it was different when I was younger. Things were even more segregated. Um, and even though it was a little less segregated in his time, he was still dealing with all kinds of crap, even him espousing himself racist concepts that he didn't even realize when he was a young kid. It was just, it was sad. Anyway, so I won't take up more time. That's just something that I thought about. Thank you very much, Jake. If anybody else wants to talk, just put your, um, I don't think we even need to, just unmute yourself because it seems like it's, we're not getting a mad rush to talk. So just unmute yourself if you want to talk. I just unmuted myself okay, uh, ahead, already. Right. So, um, hi again. Um, you know, I, I read a few of the articles. I've been reading some other things and I just got the book White Fragility through Amazon. And, uh, so, um, to kind of be, I guess, more candid. Well, I don't know if it's candid, but just um, I do see a therapist weekly and we've been having conversations about race and racism for probably a year, a year and a half. And um, I'm very well aware of wanting safe space to talk because I 
feel like hang upon the person when you have a conversation with certain people it's like you feel like you're stepping into a minefield because there's a lot of there can be a lot of built up feelings for for experiencing racism as a person of color and so sometimes i'm just hesitant i'm sure like a lot of people to say something to have a conversation because i might offend somebody but yet i want to have conversations so first i'm just grateful to have this space and i like space where we can talk so um the other thing is um um what am i trying to say <clears throat> so i guess it's about prejudice so i think as human beings we all have prejudices not just about color or race but culture uh gender sexuality i think it's part of the wiring of being human that's sort of a bigger thing too so um i think for me part of my work has been spiritual is to catch the prejudice or the prejudgments and to kind of do my own work to let those go and try to see not the person i'm projecting in front of me but listen and get to know the person who's in front of me so um that's been sort of my angle has been sort of spiritual in the sense of just the inner work with this as opposed to going out and protesting and marching so i'm just sharing that's been my angle and to be thoughtful and learn so it's good to share and then to listen so thank you thank you arnie anybody else yep george hi george uh, i want to address so I also want to build up what Arnie was talking about and also about sort of the concept of white fragility and also it's like discussions that we've been having at in my workplace, um, conscious open discussions we've been having. And um, from my previous experience doing like meeting facilitation and when talking about difficult subjects, um, I think it's really helpful to think of the concept of um, leaning into one's discomfort and not and, and actually expecting to be uncomfortable and that as white people, we're, it's gonna be uncomfortable to talk about race and we have to push ourselves. And, uh, or we can't have the conversations because we, we've had the luxury to just be silent and not really have to deal with race um, the way that um, black and brown folks do all the time. And so like at a recent, our first open conversation at work about um, responding to George Floyd's killings and responding to addressing anti-racism more broadly and being really direct about it, like our director said, like, we want to create a safe space. And I was like, um, I want to say, like, it's not safe. Like, we're in the real world. It's not safe for people. Like, just to be real, we're grappling with real things. Um, we have to, we're, we're interacting with people we see at work or, you know, in the real world that, like, I don't, I don't think safety is a, it's like not for me, like not a helpful concept. I've been at a facilitated thing where it was called safe, but it was actually completely not safe because there were real world consequences to what people talked about and we're all together. So I'm rambling a bit, but I guess what I say is I think it's a better concept to think about leaning into our discomfort and being respectful and listening to each other. Um, and to understand that like, we're all in a world that's not really safe, but that we can create space to have more understanding and respect and like make change together and improve the world. That's it. I'm sorry, I had one more comment to make. Um, it's about black and white. I just, I thought about this a number of years ago and I wanted to show you something. So I'm wearing a shirt, it has black and white on it. And in reality, I'm just gonna be sound weird, but my skin is not the same color as this shirt and your skin is not the same color as this. And to me, it sets up a polarity, you're black or white. And I kind of say, my skin is kind of peach and your skin is kind of brown. And there's a spectrum of skin colors. So I think whoever set up that black and white thing, I don't know how it got set up, but it's, it creates this dichotomy or this, this, you know what I'm trying to say, this polarization. And I wish the conversation would, would, would shift beyond that. Not that there isn't racism, but just shifting beyond a duality and kind of incorporate humanity. I don't know if I'm making sense, but something around that interests me, that's all. Thank you. Going off of what you just said, can you hear me okay? Go ahead, Michael. Um, going off with what you just said, um, I don't see why there's not more talk about how we are all one race. I mean, I think it's pretty well proven that we all came from ancestors that were not this color. I mean, isn't that true? I mean, we all migrated out in, 
and and gradually started to fade. The uh, but I mean our blood. I mean who we are as a species. We are human beings. I mean, why aren't we talking about that? Um, Eves, are, are we allowed to answer each other? Can we answer each other? I know that I know that there is a disparity, but and I know that there is systematic uh, problems. Okay. I'm not denying that, and I do understand white privilege and all that. So I don't want to go. I I'm trying to figure out how do we heal. What is the message to take us further, or actually closer together? And I already wrote to like the 23 and Me people. I'm saying you guys can prove so much. Why don't you do that? Yeah. So I thought he just kidding. Um, thank, uh, Michael. Thank you so much for your question and in Oni. But two things. This workshop is called on learning racism. So we're gonna focus on that for for at for first. And also this section is for everybody to say, you know, again, that's your that, that was your question to say, you know, what what either any question, comment, or observation from the reading or the videos that you watch that struck a chord with you. So that's your question, and I keep it in mind. And then I, I keep what what you said as well, Ani. You know as well. So I will, I want to give the the, the um, this um, I want to give the chance to other people who have not talked yet, who have not shared what 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 they observe or what question they have from the reading. List. And then the next session maybe we will sort of address some of the, some of those questions. Make sense? Hey, this is Millard. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead, Millard. Well, the thing that, that really strikes me more and more, it isn't just that people are insulted and called names, it's that people are being killed, that people are dying. And that's the thing that's really troubling to me. The thing that's even more troubling is that um, black trans people are just being killed right and left, and nothing seems to be uh, being done about it. And I'm sorry to say that, you know, as, as a gay community, I don't think that we have ever stood up for our trans, um, black trans, especially uh, siblings. And it's so ironic in this month, uh, or last month especially, because had it not been for, for our black trans siblings, Stonewall wouldn't have happened and gay rights wouldn't have happened. And so, um, you know, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, a trans person was killed and tossed in the Schuylkill River and dismembered. And it, it made almost no news. Uh, nobody seems to care. So um, it's not only, uh, you know, black people in general, but especially we need to be concerned about black trans siblings too. Thank you, Millard. Anybody else have comments about the readings or, or questions? Yeah, I, I just have a, a brief comment. It's uh, uh, interesting that uh, you know so much of this is couched in the in the concept of uh, whiteness, and uh, there, as a person who's not black or white, like uh, there is a lot of anti-black racism among people of color that are not black, right? And it's been interesting to have conversations about. Uh, there's sort of this, I think, a, a running theme that I hear about, uh, well, you know, I've been persecuted, you know, so what about me? What about, you know, my own kind of anguish and like really talking about the priority of uh, focusing on anti-black racism at this point in time. Right? And that, uh, it's, it's been a tough conversation to, to have sometimes. That's true. Thank you, Normal. Or comments about what you read or what you saw? Questions, feelings? I have a, a comment um, or just um, the Robin D'Angelo, How White Fragility Supports Racism and How Whites Can Stop It is a really good, um, solid entry point for people, um, you know, for white people entering into doing this work, in my opinion. Um, and the book, White Fragility, is another excellent one. If, haven't had a chance to check that out. Um, it really does 
um, you know, Robin D'Angelo is a white person and her specialty is specifically progressive liberal white people. So, um, which a lot of people think that because they may be liberal or progressive, they are immune to all of this. Um, and that is absolutely not true. Um, as so many of you have said, it is a thing that we are born into. Um, and it's like a disease. We will always have to deal with this. Um, it's just a question of recognizing it when we're in the weeds with it and acting out of our worst behaviors with it. But um, there's never going to come a point where we conquer racism, in my opinion. It is uh, how this country was formed and built, and there is too much uh, and broken bones and bloody bodies, in my opinion, to, to be done with it. We're just going to have to um, acknowledge that we have all of that and that when we when those things rear their ugly heads, that's when we're going to have to circle back and realize that we're, we're acting out of our worst behaviors, in my opinion. Um, but yes, the other, the other clips and, and readings, um, Eves, thanks so much for providing those. I haven't had a chance that we haven't had a chance to check them all out yet, but that one in particular stood out to me. I have to comment. I haven't read the readings. I'm sorry. I just noticed them today. Um, you know, women weren't acknowledged at the time of the birth of this country. Gay people weren't acknowledged at all. And you can go on. You know, it was a white man's world, uh, but a rich white man's world at that, the, and slaveholder wor world in the U.S. anyway. Uh, and, uh, uh, what I'm getting at is, look where we are today. Okay, as of 1920, there was a, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution giving women the right to vote. As of 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, by virtue of a Republican's one vote, uh, gave gay people marital rights. So what I'm getting at, to I guess Nathan's remark, is that it's a process. I know I'm sounding very cliche here, but I have to have hope. I, I know how bad it is, believe me, <laughs> you know, in this country. And we have a long way to go, no question, no question. But so did women, so did gay people, you know. Um, it's true, this is probably the biggest one, the, bit, the most work that we have to do. I got that. And so, um, we just have to keep going one foot in front of the other and elect the right people. Okay, so for example, the Supreme Court decision that just happened, giving finally eliminating discrimination at a federal level and actually every level really uh, against us gay people, it took till 2020 for that to happen. It's based on a 1964 piece of legislation that Kennedy and Johnson were pushing. Um, it wouldn't have happened without that. And we, we, today, this wouldn't have happened. The decision that just happened wouldn't have happened without that. So, and that's how many years? 60 years, uh, 55 years we're talking. So, um, I'll also say that with the Me Too, here's the Me Too movement, for example. I mean, how many years have women been struggling and struggling and struggling to tell their stories about oppression by men? But the day did come when the dam burst. I think the dam is kind of bursting now, in a, at least to some degree, I'll say that, at least to some degree. This is pretty remarkable what we're witnessing, honestly, that it's mostly white folks that are doing this, I don't see a whole lot of black people. Um, um, and so it, that's a big change, I think. Um, people, you know, and when, when I'll say also, when, as long as I'm talking, when I, you know, when I see that horrible video, what am I seeing of, of George Floyd, you know, or it could have been Eric Garner, God knows. So I'm seeing all the issues crystallized there that we've got, you know, income inequality, public education declining, um, um, healthcare, 
not being available, mental health care not being, all, all the major issues this country is just ignoring now uh, were crystallized for me in that one moment. Of course, race was the main one, but George Floyd, to me, brought that all together in one, you know, at once. And so that's why you see it, for example, we're suddenly thinking of changing universities' names or, you know, bottles, names on, on products. Now, I know those can be regarded as distractions, but first of all, I'll take it. You know, for, for a university, Washington and Leeds would be thinking of eliminating, you know, their names. Um, and um, Cleveland Indians baseball team are now going to, you know, seriously discuss, you know, that kind of thing. It's generating the issues of genocide. We're also, this country is also founded on genocide. Again, so I don't have to go on and on. It, I think it's got, it's got multiple issues all fused in one. And um, maybe it's everybody's out of work and they have time on their hands, but um, I just sense that so we're going we're gonna to move the ball forward is all I want to say. How far exactly, I'm not quite sure. Uh, at the, you know, uh, but things are changing. I think, and, and I've noticed with change, I'll end with this, I'll notice with change that it can, that with the, the gay rights movement particularly, you know, we, we plotted along and plotted along and plotted along and plotted along. And then, you know, a certain, a certain energy develops and then all of a sudden you crest somehow, you know? So with the race issue, it's a lot, I think it's a number of these crestings. This is the big one though, I think right now. Actually, I'd like to put in a, a personal comment here about the there is no neutral, nice white people can still be complicit in a racist society. Um, I just want to share that I think the, the biggest challenge for me in moving from um, moving into being an active anti-racist is that I really honestly thought for many years that racism was a word for people who use the n-word and for people who were blatantly stereotypical in the KKK I didn't think it applied to me because I was nice and progressive and and liberal and I had black friends and you know I was doing things to further equality in the world and I could not understand the systemic nature of it until I got past this idea that it made me a bad person. That was the work I had to do and to wake up from this idea that it means I'm bad, I'm doing something wrong, or, or I'm being judged for being a horrible person. First of all, it's not about me. And second of all, it, like we said, it's, it's something that's baked into our culture. And our job is to, to become aware of that and to become aware of how that impacts our privilege, how it impacts people of color, how it impacts everyone, and to start to work to dismantle that and have the tough conversations. I don't have all the answers. I, I stumble with this a lot. Like, you know, like Arnie said, like, what's the right thing to say? Do you be honest? Like, a lot of times I feel like an ally who's being attacked and then I have to deal with my, you know, am I having white fragility? And it gets very complicated and hard to know what the right thing is to do. And I, I'm at the point now where I'm just like, okay, it's going to have to be that way for a little while. And we're just going to have to keep talking about it until we figure it out. So I think the biggest thing for white people is to realize that, like, you're part of a system. Nobody's saying you're a bad person. We're saying we need you in this fight. We need you to speak up. That's all I have to say for now. Who's next? Go ahead, Jake. So one thing that, um, that I noticed happening to myself was, um, because I'm trans, right? I'm an Arab American. Um, I'm pansexual. I w lived as a lesbian for a long time, you know, so I've been, in, you know, came out when I was a teenager. So I've been in oppressed groups like all my life, you know, and 
and I know I caught myself kind of doing this comparing of oppressed peoples and of my experience. And I was like, oh, whoa, like I'm resisting looking at this issue and centering this, this experience. And so I kind of, you know, that felt disturbing <laughs> to notice that. But I, I think that's, um, I would venture to say, probably a really common thing for people that are white to, to kind of, to resist it and kind of, you know, instead of, you know, and that's curious. It's like, you know, this is a huge, huge systemic issue as all those other issues are, but this is the issue we're looking at. <laughs> this, is, this is a serious, serious problem that causes hor horrific things to still be happening. And um, yeah, so it's just, I'm just cu still curious about my own resistance. Like, what am I afraid? What am I so afraid of? Why am, why am I kind of looking at my transness or looking at, you know, queerness or why am I doing that, you know? Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just, yeah, I think it's overwhelming to think about the history of, you know, for me personally, you know, of black people and how many of them have come to this country and how they were treated. It's just so horrific. It's, it's, um, tragic. And, um, I'm just, I just feel, you know, like I said, I'm 60, I just turned 60 and it's, it's like, I'm, I feel really, it feels hopeful to me that this movement, this is finally starting, it's like, it feels like we're cleansing a wound, you know, there's this wound and we're getting all the, inf we're, tr we're starting to get some infection out. And I hope, I hope, I pray that we can keep on doing it, you know, that it, that it will continue. Anyway, thank you. Before, uh, before anyone says something, I want to just sort of like wrap up or at least make a comment. Um, thank you, Freddie. Thank you to thank to all of you <coughs> who have sort of shared so far what what um, you know what struck with you, what struck call with you or not. Um, the, the, so first of all, um, I think uh, Michael and Arnie, um, you mentioned. So I think. The conversation, we, the conversation about the human race, which is the the, the 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 real thing, you know, we could be having it, and we should be having that conversation, but not at this point. And I want to I want to mention a, a book, um, if you have, if you um, if you don't mind to, um, to to read, it's called The Myth of Race by Robert Sussman was a Harvard, um, Harvard uh, educated uh, anthropologist. So to say that, you know, race uh, was, is not and has never been a valid biological category in humans. So with that book, I think it was published, uh, my goodness, yeah. It must have been, oh, in 2014. So The Myth of Race, please go read that book by Robert Sussman. So then, then you can understand why. Okay, then we can understand why why we need to have this conversation. You know, the, go ahead. Eves, did you yeah. say what it, the means of race? Oh, yes, yes, Freddie. I'm gonna put it in the chat. The means of race. No, yes. the myth. Myth. Sorry, the myth. Thank you, thank you, George. No, no, no. The myth. Uh, the myth let me tap it. The myth. George, put it in the chat for us. Thank you. Go ahead, Eve. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. So, by the way, perfect. by the way, sorry, you know, I have an accent and also I speak fast, but I'm going to try to slow down because I'm so excited. Okay. Um, so, there's that. But, you know, I'm sure um, Nathan and I can talk about the sort of daily racism that we experience. And I'm just going to speak for myself, but later you can, you can share. Just to tell you how important it is, and we're not talking about, we, even first of all, we talk about 400 years of that system that existed. But it has taken on so many different forms, not just individual, institutionalized, structural, everything like that. I'm six foot two. Slash, I, I think I, was, I used to be six foot, but now I'm shrinking because I'm getting older too. Um, but I stand straight. I used to be an insert, and I have now, I have a high top. So I'm a big black man, okay? 
that in itself is a threat. So if I'm walking on, on, down the street, some white person, it could be all white men or all white lady, seeing me, guess what do they do? They cross to the other side of the street. If I'm in another elevator, and they, if I was in the elevator first, they see me, they really hesitate before getting in unless there's somebody else coming to them. I'm going to a store to buy something. I'm being worshipful. I mean, you know, we, simple, simple little thing like that. We are in a work meeting, and I'm the only black person at the, at the table, and whatever I'm saying, and you can tell that it's being looked at in, in so many different microscopes. So we have, it's, so right now, that's why right now the conversation is not about the human race, but about racism. Because this is what black and white people are experiencing on a daily, on a daily, on a daily basis. And now I'm going to take you to another personal level. And that's why I, when I gave that example earlier of my friend's boyfriend who did it, who used to be a black man, and, but actually he turns out, well, he's a Trumper, but I think he's racist too, you know? So, and, and I had to think about the different boyfriends that I had or even friends that I had. We certainly actually, ha I was having a conversation with one friend uh, while well, we both met at Columbia University and I invited him. I mean, of course, he's from a well-off family, you know, even if I'm not, that's fine, <laughs> but I would, we would do, I mean, he's really sweet and yeah, actually we, he's much younger than me, but you know, we would do different things together besides the program that we we're in, you know, we were, you know, cool, but you know, we had other, um, we, 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 had, we both had interest in spirituality, in cultures and everything like that, but there was something simple he never did. I would invite him to my home. I would meet what I'm, he never invited me, he never invited me to his home. And we've been friends of creeps and I said, I'm like, what is that? And I recently, after the first birthday, I, I, I sent him, it, actually, it, it texted me, and I, and I said, I said, hey, I'm not doing well, this is, I'm, I'm, because I'm having all those thoughts. And I said, hey, why, did you have, why didn't you ever invite me to your home? And then he paused. He's like, oh my gosh, if I didn't realize I was doing that. You know, and he said, well, you know, I mean, and he acknowledged, you know what, I realize I have racist tendencies, my family has racist tendencies, you know, just because you're from different socioeconomic background than me and different ways, so I had a pause. So that's what we're talking about. So even the friends that we have, that we care about, like I said, he's a sweet boy, I liked him, but he, because of his, his internalized racism or, what, or the legacy of racism, so we have not been able to be the best friends that couldn't have been. And now we're having this discussion, he and I, hopefully, hopefully maybe a year from now we can become, but again, he was not even aware that he was doing it. So this is where we need to tackle the issue, like on that one-on-one -on -one level. And I'm assuming, and by the way, I have to give, I don't know them, I just met them for the first time, but Nathan and Robert, I have to give them props because I'm sure they must be having this conversation on a daily basis because it's not easy to be, to, 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 to be in an interracial friendship or in an interracial relationship in a racist society. Because again, so, so that, so, so the society in America doesn't treat us differently and on all levels, you know? So that's the comment that I want to say, and then I want, I want folks to, um, you can continue sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Eves. Are we still sharing? Okay. Eve, sir, is the group still um, doing sharing? Should I have people chime in? Uh, yes, I would love for us to chime in. So whatever, you know, um, um, comments, questions, you know, you have about everything we've, been, we've talked about so far, yes, please chime in. Well, I, I actually want to address this idea that a couple of people have mentioned this idea that we're all one race and why do we not focus on that and and that is a wonderful aspirational thing that's where we want to get but I believe that we can't get there if we don't acknowledge just how much we're not there and why and address those issues so that we can get there um, but I, I, I aspire to the same thing. Of course, that's where we all want to be eventually. But um, I just think it's important to acknowledge that some things need to be looked at and fixed in order to get there. And I would also say when, you know, when we talk about 
all the different groups of people who are oppressed, I like to use the analogy that I've heard many times. If, if you go to an emergency room, and every, everybody in the emergency room is sick, but you take care of your triage, you take care of what's the most bleeding out right now. And the thing that's happening right now, at this point in time in history, is the killings, the oppression of black people. And I think that's kind of why you're seeing that focused on right now. So I'm making a distinction between what's aspirational in the long run and what needs to be focused on in order to get there, in my opinion. And I just want to respond to that. This is not one of the people talked about that. It's not either or. We can do both. You know, it's not either or. So I yeah, just to say that, and it doesn't saying one doesn't diminish the immediacy of what's happening, and also the the history of what's been happening. Just to make that clear, it wasn't because one thing I talked about uh, in therapy is is looking at um, what is it? It's sort of like denial is the way you're approaching this denial or acknowledgement. It's it's it can be a very well, again, I think this process is individual for each of us. No, we're not going to have one uniform process around any any ism, whatsoever. You know, so so uh, anyway, I don't know if I'm making sense again, but I know what I'm trying to say. It's it's not either or. So, and it's individual as well as a collective issue. I found myself rereading history from a different lens through a different lens. Um, uh, I think. Most of us were taught history in high school, college, grade school from a white perspective, and it was whitewashed. And uh, someone mentioned Stonewall. Um, and I grew up, I mean, I live in Boston now. I was raised in Northern Kentucky um, and went to a high school that was, uh, you know, I, we had black folk in the school and, you know, they were just fellow students. And one memory that I was kept on going through my head was when my mother died when I was young, 16, my grandmother worked in an apartment store in Cincinnati and her boss came to uh, my mother's funeral. And that really had an impact on me because her boss um, was this very beautiful, professional uh, black woman. And for her to come um, really meant a lot. And uh, I think that my history, um, you know, the cliche, I, I have black friend, you know, I have black friends. I, I want to have conversation with them. I've been hearing that I should not, need not expect them to teach me what I need to, to learn. Um, someone in the building mentioned reading Malcolm X's autobiography, which I've started. Um, I'll go to the reading list that you had mentioned. Um, so, you know, just looking at history through a different lens, I'm fortunate to live right around the corner from the Mass Historical Society, and they've been doing webinars on hist related history, and that has been very, very helpful and given me a different perspective of the 400 years, as well as the stories that Eves and, and Nathan probably could tell of their experiences. You know, the whole, another cliche, walking a mile in my shoes, I, I haven't walked an inch in your shoes and I, I, so I can't, I don't know what it's like, except by your, your telling your stories. And I think that's very important as well. Thanks, Stephen. I'd like to say something too, that I, I, I want to make sure that I, I don't remain silent the whole time. I want to uh, you have, lend my voice to this. I, I, I grew up in, in a very uh, segregated place. I, I think our town was just just one percent African American, and it was uh, I, you know, I just didn't learn very much. And it's been a real uh, learning process as an adult, getting to know 
uh, black men and black women. And so uh, I've really um, you know, learned a lot over the past few weeks. I, I never really thought about how a lot of uh, government programs and policies that have just been so systemically. I didn't understand it until, until I read it. Like, oh, I, I never thought of this is what is, is really happening. And this is what, what that law was really meant to do. Uh, I always thought, as others have said, oh, racism is very clearly this and that. Those who belong to this group will say these words. I'm like, oh, no, it's much more subtle. It's much more systemic. So I, I've really just, uh, just really acknowledged that over the last few weeks. And um, that's why I really wanted to join this workshop and to learn more going forward. Just wanted to share that with you all. Thanks. Thank you very in Boston much. this year, um, we fought the bigger Boston Pride was canceled, but then there was a um, Black Trans Resistance March that was organized and led by Black trans women um, that was incredibly successful, had a huge turnout, really focused on Black Trans Lives Matter um, and uh, police brutality. It was a peaceful march. Thousands of people joined it. Um, I didn't feel safe to go because of my immune suppression, but I was... Um, have developed relationships with the leaders of that movement and uh, was able to contribute financially to help them um, and sort of spread the word and lift up their voices. And it was like, Pride was started as a protest, like Stonewall, Black trans women in leadership positions. These, uh, Athena Vaughn and Chastity Bowick, who are leading the uh, Boston Trans Resistance March and Vigil, are incredible leaders. They've stepped up into leadership, called things out, and it's just been really terrific to see. And um, because historically, unfortunately, like there's been problems with le the leadership of the regular pride, like over time, like black pride gets sort of shunned aside, doesn't get a lot of resources, like, and so it's, it's time, some, it's times to, for white folks and like white men to step aside, to lift up uh, black folks, listen to black folks, listen to black trans women and other black trans folks. I'm also transgender myself. Um, so I feel like that's also really important and to financially support people and organizations that are doing the work. Thank you, George. Uh, I wanted to say two more things. Um, thank you, George. <clears throat> The other day, I had this question um, in my mind um, about, you know, Stonewall riots. So the, the following year after, the, after it happened, of course, we had Marsha P. Johnson and then all the other trans, you know, who were like really, uh, you know, fighting back. But the following year, you know, what the first part became like, you know, a protest. And everybody rally, you know, around those pioneers, you know. And now, I mean, I think, well, in New York City, I think it was like, you know, um, still this school has been 50 years. But then it's been like, I think, 50, sec 50, 50 second years um, since. You Leaves, we lost you. Let's just give it a minute. Maybe it'll come back. We were to do it for, for pride. How we could not do it for, you know, for racism to dismantle that and then to make it a celebration, celebration of black and brown, and brown lives. And I think Nima said something, um, you know, because oftentimes, you know, it's not like brown are for, forgotten, but the, 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 um, the story of blacks and white, you know, because it dated back 400 years. But now everybody who came, you know, later on, whether, you know, you're yellow, you know, Asians or, or, or Latino or, you know, Indians or you're brown. So at some point you get treated as well as blacks. You know what I mean? That's why, you know, we keep, we keep saying, but again, we keep going that I think, I think the, the origin started with the way blacks or Africans were treated, you know, in this, uh, in, in, on this land by white, you know, settlers. And then, and everything should go, should go down. You know, so so I, I so I want to I want to put it out there because I know we can do it, and I know despite everything that has happened, you know, after Judge Floyd. So I, I I'm seeing the pain. I personally, I'm you know, I'm I have I'm experiencing a mix of emotions from anger, sadness, anxiety, you know, fear, because I know that any day now I could be Judge Floyd. Any day now 
I could be Richard Brooks. And I'm playing it in my head, okay, what if, and also any day now, I could meet with another Karen. Like, I keep playing that, those scenarios in my head, okay, what am I going to do if I meet with a Karen? A white woman who thinks that, you know, you, can, you know, like, this is, this is the reality. This is my reality. This is the reality of black and brown folks. That at any point in time, we're going to meet another Karen, or we're going to meet some, you know, racist police officer or whatever. But I've been also thinking, and also I've been seeing hopes, because yesterday I read an article on, on CNN by an eight-year-old boy. I think he's mixed with, but it's, he had his face that are black, and he was adopted by a white women. He organized a march, a Black Lives Matter march for kids like himself. That's amazing. Eight-year-old. You can look it up on, on CNN. I'm like, okay, we do have some hopes. And then for the first time also, we've seen so many white allies because they realize dismantling systemic racism is not about getting revenge, but it's about promoting equality for everybody. Because even some white folks also sometimes, you know, are, um, to, do, do fall through the cracks as well. Because I work in social services. I know, like, you know, the white homeless folk that I work with, you know, um, you know those who, are, who struggle with substance abuse and, and homelessness, whatever. I see that they, they do not, they do not have, I, I would say their whiteness sometimes, you know, don't matter or don't really help them. And, 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 and usually that's when they realize how messed up the system is. I also work with seniors, you know, on pal in palliative care unit in hospitals where, you know, they're about to die. That's when they realize what's really happening. Because most of us, who, you know, I'm, I'm a frontline worker. Most of us who do this kind of work, you know, we're not white, you know, and, and, but also we're very compassionate. And, we can, and then that's usually I'll have some interesting um, 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 hindsight, you know, on, 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 on you know, how the system has kept us and continue to keep us so divided. And I think that's why, you know, unfortunately and also luckily, we must have those uncomfortable conversations so that we can sort of bridge the, those, those gaps because we need to come together and, and face this demon for good. Because again, if we were able to do it for pride, I don't see why we can do it for systemic racism because now pride is a big celebration. But again, originally it was a protest. So now if all of us could put our heads together and start protesting, I think it's might cut out again. It'll come back. I just, no, no, I, I, fin I, I finished my poem, so I put myself, I unmute myself. I mean, I mute myself, so now I let, I, let, I leave. Oh, so you're done with your point. Okay, great. Thanks, Eves. Okay, anybody else want to comment? Yes, real quick, I'd just like to say um, something that's come from Nathan and I being together and conversations we've had that um, one thing he said is I, I don't get a pass or maybe it was said somewhere in our conversations. I don't think anybody as a white person gets a pass for saying how you were brought up. I was raised in a little town, 400 people, all, probably all racist. Um, so all those things along my life don't give me a pass to not listen, not learn, and not keep moving forward. So um, that's all I plan to do. And I hope that everyone else will see that, that they can say along the way, oh, I had a black friend. Well, that's not a pass. Um, none of it's a pass. We all have to keep learning, reading, you know, educating ourselves and just um, being along with every black person we can for the fight. Yeah, I think that that's pretty much what this group in the reading is pointing us to is to see those things where we never saw them before. Um, I, I, um, 
like this whole thing with the Confederate um, monuments and everything. I didn't see how that was so bad. I was thinking, okay, we can come up with a better idea. What about all these wonderful um, artists we have out there, black artists? Is there any way we can kind of, like on that stone wall, that I mean, not stone wall, that stone mountain, I think, that beautiful um, carved mountain with those Confederates, why don't we carve more into it and kind of bring it all together? And I didn't, I didn't, um, and, and somehow, you know, everything that was there, you know, expand the story. Um, but I read this article this week by, um, and she's, this was in the New York Times, and I actually met her in Nashville at a ballet. She did this um, um, redux of a Shakespeare in a black, about the, his black, um, lover. Some of you may have known about her, but it was just wonderful. And she actually, this was this Sunday, she said, she addressed that issue. She said, you want a Confederate uh, monument? Not that I want a Confederate monument, but what she said to, said was, look at my body. This is the body that my ancestors were raped by Confederate soldiers. You want to see a monument to the confederacy this is it and then she she's a poet and so she went on and on with that and i went whoa i had never realized the impact of that of all those things and um and my idea of trying to bring it all together uh into some artistic form uh to me you know just came crashing down with those statues you know i mean i mean There's a, there's a lot of pain that we're just now beginning to understand. I just really appreciate what you just shared, Michael. Um, and I, um, so the, the thing about history in this country is that our history has been sort of compartmentalized and it's been segregated. So it's not a surprise to me that, that someone might think that um, maybe we're just not looking at history the right way, or maybe these monuments have value as a relationship to history. Um, it's because um, people have been through high school and graduate from college and they, they have um, no idea about the other part of our history because it's so segregated. Um, so uh, to your point, and I think other people, I think Stephen was saying that he was looking at history through a different lens. That is the biggest thing that when uh, my white friends ask me what they can do, um, one of the things I tell them is to go back and look at history um, and look at it in its entirety um, and go to other sources beyond the ones that we grew up with uh, to, to gain a, a bigger understanding. I'm also telling people to go to the National Museum of African American History, which there is a museum of American history in DC also, so that's segregated too, ah! <laughs> but it's important to see this because the experience of traveling through this whole museum, you get a very visceral um, understanding of, of the history of African Americans, how we came to this country and how we progress through history. Um, so that is really important. Another thing that Robin DiAngelo suggested, and I really love this, is um, when uh, she says that when white people don't know what to do, or they say they don't know what to do, um, she suggests writing down why you think you don't know what to do, or writing down what you don't know what to do, and let the things that you write down become your list of sort of bullet points to, or a strategy list, you know, it's like if you don't know what to do because you don't know any African Americans, then Maybe you should get to know some African Americans. It's a really interesting way of approaching a problem, uh, which you know may be helpful for other things too. Um, and you know, just one more point about um, about um, you know the experience that I have in this country of day to day life 
it is uh, very, there's a lot of extra work that I do to try and, I have a hyper um, condition to, to live in, in society and to, to make white people comfortable. I grew up in a mostly half, half the time in a white school and the other time in a black community. So, so there's like this weird sort of hybrid thing happening and there's all of this conditioning, you know, there's, there's things that I do when I'm in this store, like I'm hyper aware of where security guards are. Um, I am, I never touch things unless I'm actually going to buy them. Um, you know, once we were in the store and he was touching things and picking them up and I don't ever touch anything. I don't put my hands in my pocket. This is all a part of the education that I was given as a young black person. Um, you know, and we got out of the store and somebody ran out and accused me of stealing, even though I hadn't actually uh, touched anything. And this is not the first time that that has happened. Um, it's, it's these everyday things that happen um, that uh, the black community sort of internalizes those things. And, you know, another thing, you know, this happened in the parking lot and I can't get angry because my rage is immediately interpreted as a threat. So my rage doesn't go anywhere. I don't know how to express things like that. Um, I'm just telling you this so that uh, you just have a better understanding of why uh, when George Floyd was murdered, um, why riots happen. People don't have any other place for these microaggressions and furious things and daily things to go. And um, then something really big happens and it sets it all aflame. Um, and, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Nathan was talking about um, and expounding on this idea of looking at history through a different lens. And that's why I, I shared in the chat that I recommend the movie The 13th. I know a lot of people have seen it by now. But for me, it really did a great job at really showing the breadth of just how like all these different things are connected from the war on drugs to the industrial prison complex to, you know, and it taught me a lot about how growing up in the 80s, how media indoctrinated me to be afraid of black men and things like that. She, Ava does a really great job of kind of just showing you the scope of, of the system itself. So I really recommend you watch that movie to get another lens on history like we were talking about. Um, to add to that, thank you, Nathan and uh, Michael, for sharing. Um, it's not just revisiting history, I even like just looking at history from now the oppressed perspective, like uh, Stephen was talking about. It's, it's, it's just not everything. I mean, again, I'm a black man, immigrant. I've been in this country for 21 years. And recently, after George Ford's you know, tragic racist murder, I stumbled upon a, a TikTok video made by a 16-year-old black boy, or I think maybe 14 or something. You guys might have seen it, or maybe I shouldn't say it to you. So in that video, and it, it talks about the exact same thing that Nathan was talking about, like you know, a list of instruction given by his mother on how yeah. to navigate the world so that to, in order to look less threatening. But actually, it's not really less threatening, it's to look less black. Because in this country, being black means it's a threat. And, and it hit me so hard. And I'm like, because I moved here, I was 26, thank God. <laughs> because I, I didn't have that experience. And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that I'm happy that African Americans had had the experience, but again, the fact that I had a different experience made me see things from a different perspective. I mean, first of all, to me, this is what I call that systemic dehumanization of black people. And it started early, like at five years old. I had friends, a colleague at, at, at work, 
who tell me that they start talking with their boy, with their, their sons, especially at five years old, to give to pass on those instructions. I'm like, to me, this is like, um, it's not just nightmarish. What, how do you call it? Like, you know, this is, it, 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 you're, killing, you're, you're killing their innocence so early. And I didn't have to do that. I didn't, I didn't go through that. Because when I, when I was like 16 or 19, I was going to the store. I never, you know what I mean? And when I came to, I'm like, oh my gosh. And then this is what it is. So, so it's everything. Because again, why does, or why do any family would have to talk to their five-year-old, their six-year-old, please behave a certain way because the white lady over next door might think, you know, you want this, or the guy at the grocery store might think you want this. Or the, I mean, this is crazy. Really, really crazy. But again, imagine also the kind of things that it does to your psyche. Again, for me, because I've been here, I came here as an adult, but and I still see the toll that it takes on my psyche. But imagine how it is for folks who have lived here for generation for generation. Like I had colleagues who tell me, like those who, who are doing the exact same thing, that passing those, those instruction to their um, um, black boys and stuff. But they said that those instructions have been passed down from their grandfather to their fathers, their fathers. I mean, this is insane. And and I also realized the reason why. Um, they, they are doing, I mean, do, doing this. Uh, uh, yesterday I was, I was watching uh, 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 an interview between Anderson Cooper and Trevor Noah. So they talk about the otherness or the otherizing of, of us. So black people is a threat. So they don't, they don't, we, we, we're not portrayed as human. We, have, we are portrayed as the other. And that's what makes it so easy for them to maintain this system. So the, and, the, and, and again, now we're talking among us LGBT folks. So it's a group of gay men. So how come that we are joined by this? We all LGBT, you know, same sex, same gender loving, identified and stuff like that. But then when it comes to um, sort of social construct, which is race, then we're all divided again. But again, I see how it is, how it's being perpetrated. It's because, you know, they ordering us, they keep ordering us over and over again. And then that's what has happened. So if in order for us to change that, to unlearn that, we need to revisit all of those, you know, we need from the oppressive um, perspective, like Steve, that Stevens talked about Nathan support and all that kind of stuff. Thank you. And what Nathan was saying was his history, is his history. And I view the same video that you had mentioned. And, uh, I was, you know, it, it was just unbelievable to me that these sort of talks, you know, we all have talks with our parents, but to have that talk uh, just seemed, it, it was mind blowing. It, it, I, that's all I can say. So, you know, I think history goes 400 years ago, but also up to current um, Nathan and it, you know, your histories as well. And I really appreciate the conversation today. I've been talking a lot, so I'm going to stop talking, but, but just two more things, and then I promise I won't say anything else. Um, the, uh, I don't want to sound like I, I, don't have, I don't have hope. I'm really skeptical about a lot of things just because, like I said, um, the, the breadth of all of this is just really heavy and old, and I know that our stamina for dealing with anything unpleasant is not very high i mean we had this pandemic and people quickly got tired of it and now all kinds of bad behavior is happening so i'm hoping that uh that this is progress and that people will continue to to do this but we'll see um but just on a on a hopeful note um i feel like like systematic racism um and this particular problem is like a disease um and when i say that that we won't ever be rid of it. It's like a, it's like diabetes or heart disease. It's one of those things that we can live with um, if we change the way that we, that we live. Um, and some of these changes are big. There's significant ones that um, will extend our lifespan and make the quality of our lives better together. But we have to be committed to making these changes and sticking with them. You know. If we think of it like diabetes, then we can't do it for a little while and then jump back to eating candy bars. We have to really commit to sticking with it um, and doing the hard work. 
Um, and I, I believe that people are more interested in doing that than ever. Um, so there's that. And then the other thing that I like to tell people to do um, just for fun is uh, when you uh, go to the supermarket the next time or really any big store that has products in it, try to find the black hair care product section of your store. Um, see if you can find it. If your store has one, um, you'd be amazed at how um, separate that stuff is. It's a, a little tiny example of how our everyday lives are segregated too, um, that most people don't even think about. It's not where shampoo and hair care products are for everybody else. It's usually a tiny little aisle that's separate and somewhere else. Um, and you may not even have one at all, but just, just for fun, see if you can find it in the place that you usually get things. <laughs> so it's funny, time is running really fast. Um, so, one of the last thing I, I, you know, um, by the way, thank you so much, Nate, and everybody who's, who's been sharing. Um, I don't know how, how we're going to be able to, I mean, as you can see, like, you know, racism is going to take a long, long time, if not forever, you know, um, to, to be, to unlearn, because again, it's a learned behavior. And um, it's, it's in a, a, it, you know, it, it's present in everything, every single action that you do. Like, I, for example, when I said about my friend who, you know, we've been friends and he is a good kid, he never invited me to his home because, you know, I, I guess he didn't want, he, even if he told his parents about me, but, you, but the, 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 the whole th scenario, like I said, we, we are classmates, we hear everything like that, you know, in, in that shame. And of course, you've heard stories where people who had um, a, a person of color as a lover, you know, they said, well, I can never take that person home because my parents would not approve of, you know what I mean? So that's, so it's not just happening from people who are in, in a uh, romantic relationship, but among friends. So, so it, 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 it's really embedded in the psyche. So my, 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 my hope, and like as Nathan said, you know, I, it's going to be a long, a long, a long journey, but also I would encourage, like Steven said, you know, to revisit everything, every single action you were doing. For example, if you were the kind of person, like if you see a tall black man like myself, and you would have to cross the street because we're on the same lane, to so think about that before you do that the next time. Because again, that sends a message to someone like me, is like, oh, okay, so I guess, you know, I'm, I'm threatening, you know what I mean? And we, and we do those things, you know, without even being aware of, of, of them, you know, and it, and I know now this is the pandemic and we were all masked and everything like that. But again, those little microaggressions, you know, are really, are really painful. Um, so I was gonna, cause my, my thing, I think it's always good, you know, to end something, not just on a good note, but also come up with some kind of resolution. So we've talked about different ways, you know, kind of wisdom show, shows its ugly ebb. Um, you know, whether structurally, you know, institutionally or on a personal level or interpersonal level. So I don't know if anybody would like to sort of like um, not make some commitment, but maybe archic not articulate, but vocalize, you know, one of the few things that they, they, gonna be, they, they can do or they would will, will, will commit themselves to do in order to unlearn part of that unlearning behavior. And then if they can even say, you know what, me and my friends or me and my lover, we're gonna join forces and we're gonna we're for not doing those, for not repeating those learned behaviors, you know? So again, like I said, um, um, yeah, any, anything that, you know, any example or, or, you know, something that you, you know, each of you can commit to say, well, you know, at least those two things, I'm no longer gonna be, uh, uh, I'm no longer gonna be needing needing them. To, I'm, you know, I'm no longer gonna be doing them, and I and I want somebody to hold me accountable, or I want someone to support me in no longer doing that because they think that's how we start making changes. So, um, thank you. Thank you, Eves. Are you asking us to? Talk about those things now? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, any anything you know, like it's you know, um, that you something like it's like a personal um goal for yourself, you know, to say you know what I will no longer be willing to do that, or I'll pay attention, you know, not to do that, and then maybe ask somebody to hold you accountable because that's how we start on learning something, you know. Is that well, I'll speak for myself first. Um, I am someone who has a voice and a platform in different sub-communities and, and groups of people. And I'm committing to continuing to find opportunities and to create opportunities to have conversations like this, to help to create space and, help, and, and platforms for people to, to grow and change together. And to continue to you know, be aware of my own internal racism that has been indoctrinated in me by the by the system, and to just continue to have real conversations with people and and facilitate those the best I can, and to make mistakes and be okay with that. I want to chime in one thing I I don't think we I've heard tonight uh, today um, in this discussion. I'm a big, I'm going to do all I can to change personally, obviously. As I said, I admitted I became an American racist when I became an American, but um, I believe in legislation being very, very important. I know this is not exactly what Eve is talking about, but um, we just in New York elected the first gay black um, member of Congress from Rockland County, Mondaire Jones. Um, who's a justice um, affiliated with, the, uh, supported by the Justice Democrats. Um, and then next door, we um, elected a black representative that took over from Elliot Engel. Um, and then across, in the Bronx, we elected a black, the first black Latino uh, to Congress. Uh, Jamal Jamal Bowman is the is the uh, man who uh, took over is going to take over from Elliot Engel. What, what am I? I'm not responsible for any of that, except that I do contribute. I do get on the phone. I, I uh, I'm obviously over on the left politically, and I support these candidates because I believe these are the kind of candidates um, that we have that are going to implement the kind of legislative change that we need. We need we you know so that. Um, Governor Cuomo finally just, after all, after two plus terms, finally signed a piece of legislation last week or about 10 days ago, banning chokehold and eliminating the 50A section in the law that uh, shielded police dis disciplinary records from being revealed, that kind of thing. Uh, unfortunately, it's taken this kind of an effort going into the streets. But I think I'm also saying that real change is only going to come from going out in the streets. I'm, kind of, I'm sounding like Bernie Sanders all of a sudden, but um, I think that's, that's true in this country, certainly, maybe everywhere in the world. Uh, it takes getting out into the streets right? just that way uh, for people to pay attention, it seems to me. Whether we're talking, and, and just look at the last 40, 50, 60 years, the, the, any change that has occurred in recent memory anyway. But anyway, I just want to go back to my original point that you, know, you just get on the phone and you, 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 you uh, promote, you, you, you campaign for candidates that are going to bring about the change that we need. It'll force mainstream pow white power structure, there's my strong words, mainstream white power structure politicians to um, listen. And, and, and vote the right way. So that's what I'm doing. I, I, that's what I will continue to do, speaking just for myself. So I, I'm sorry, but I need to chime in and say that um, this conversation is definitely far from over. This is the beginning of something. I think that this was a good first step and that we are going to be looking for opportunities to create more conversations like this and doing that. Um, but we are 10 minutes over the time already and we do have to get ready for the next session. So uh, I apologize, but I'm going to have to say that we're going to continue this at a next talk that we, <laughs> we sponsor. And I want to thank Eves, and I want to thank everybody for, um, for participating. And again, it's far from over. I see this as a beginning. 
and you can be expecting more opportunities for conversations like this uh, in the near future. So thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. It was wonderful meeting meeting you all. I think there's a couple of faces that I met last time I was at Eastern Mountain. Um, so I hope we'll continue as well as the conversation and. I want to be part of that conversation. Um, and again, like I said, uh, we, we have to start somewhere. And I really believe because we created pride, gay pride. So if we could do pride, I think we can create a, like a celebration of like, you know, the end of system or the dismantling of system racism. So um, thank you so much. Thank you, Eves. And thanks to everyone for showing up and, and being honest and having the dialogue. Let's do it again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.